Cool. Hey guys, I'll go live again for another 30 minutes. Just the disclaimer I must put up is none of this is medical advice. You know, nothing is for the treatment or prevention or, um, or, um, uh, prescribing or anything like that. We're just chatting about, um, health and wellness info from an education and inspiration perspective. I of course expect you to look at it in the context of your own health conditions, your own medical issues, and make sure you check with a healthcare provider. Um, yeah, I got to throw that, that, uh, disclaimer in there. Okay. So I saw a question in my lap in the Q and A that was just up. Make sure you watch that in the next 24 hours. It didn't let me save it. Hopefully I can save this one. Love, love you Insta. Um, I saw a really good question, which was how come, uh, lino linoleic acids and PUFAs are recommended for acne and are so helpful in the treatment and the prevention of acne? Well, the interesting thing about polyunsaturated fats that you guys have to understand is that they are in fact immunosuppressive. And so just because something has an, um, a short-term anti-inflammatory effect, like we've talked about before, does not mean that it is automatically good. It can have problems long term. And this is very common with things like fish oil. What you'll see is you'll see the accumulation of acrolein. You'll see things like lipofus can take place. But these are not things that are talked about because these come after years and years of polyunsaturated fat exposure. And, you know, the immediate effect of these polyunsaturated fats are good, right? But long term, they cause metabolic disorders and lots and lots of issues. And I can't talk about it much here because oftentimes I'll get censored or like shut down. Um, but I highly recommend just doing the research um, and looking into it for yourselves. Hello, do you believe in calcium shell and in impacting the thyroid? Oh uh, yeah, I do believe the calcium shell exists, not on everybody, but it just really depends on the person. If you've gotten a hair tissue mineral analysis and you do in fact have a high, high calcium in the hair, um, it could possibly be a calcium shell. It's always possible, but um, I don't believe that's the only reason why calcium could be showing up very elevated on an HTMA. So um, I do believe in the calcium shell, but I don't believe it's applicable to everyone. Hey Cassie, I hope you're doing really, really well. It's so good to see your face or your, I should say your handle. Feeling tired around 2 p.m. every day, why? Oftentimes we are not feeding ourselves enough. Remember guys, we are grown women. We need to actually fuel ourselves like grown women. We don't need to eat the amount of calories meant for a four-year-old little girl. And so oftentimes women are skipping breakfast, eating very tiny lunches, maybe eating a little something for breakfast, a little something for lunch, pounding the coffee. And then by 2 p.m. they're wondering, God, why do I want to take a nap at my desk? And I'm like, you know, it'd be like driving around a car with barely any gas in the tank. You know, you're, you're, you're a fully functioning Ferrari. You need to feed yourself like one. So just make sure if you guys are getting tired around 2 p.m. or you're getting the afternoon slump, you're eating breakfast within an hour of waking, you're getting enough protein and carbs, you're getting a, a, a balanced snack, you know, a couple hours later, and then you're having a really nice lunch that's not a bunch of crap and uh, is actually high quality and nutrient dense. And, and then observe and see if you're having more energy around 2 p.m. A friend of mine just told me to take two Brazilian nuts a day to help with hyper and hypothyroidism. Thoughts? Um, Brazilian nuts are known to have a lot of selenium in them, and selenium can be a thyroid supportive mineral. So, um, it, you know, it's one of those things where I've, I've had clients that are deficient in selenium and are doing two Brazil nuts a day, so I don't know how... Um, how supportive it is, but that doesn't mean that they couldn't have been more deficient in selenium after, you know, if they weren't doing that. So, um, yeah, it, it's one of those things where it's definitely kind of like a common, a common, I don't want to call them myth because I know they are rich in selenium, but I highly recommend getting Brazil nuts that are shell, have the shells on them and cracking the nuts yourself. I know that's a little more work, but it's kind of fun to crack nuts anyways, um, just because their fats have not gone rancid. And so they're a little bit more nutrient dense than something that was maybe shelled six months ago and transported and has gone completely rancid. Um, remember the shells of nuts protect nuts from going rancid in the light and the heat and the oxygen. So there's a reason why nuts actually come in shells and in the wild you would find them shelled. And, you know, oftentimes we're getting our nuts off of the shelves at Whole Foods and we're thinking, they're just as healthy <laughs> as the ones that are found in the wild and that's just not so it's just not so is it safe to take oregano every day i've heard it can wipe out the good bugs too should we pair it with a probiotic 
Personally, I take it most days, but I'm not taking like super high doses of it. If I was taking like a high amount of oregano, like, you know, 30 or 40 drops, then yeah, I would definitely have, um, do it only for a short period of time and take a probiotic afterwards. But I think like the serving size on oregano is like two drops maybe. So if I was just, I, I usually take that much, um, give or take maybe a few drops. Sometimes I'll do like 10, um, and I don't really stress about it at all. I don't know if you answered yet, but why do you think high lin linoleic acid oils help acne so much if poofas are so bad for the skin? Like I said before, I kind of answered it at the beginning is remember polyunsaturated fats are immunosuppressive. So if you have lots of inflammation, if you have um, like, you know, uh, in inflammatory issues coming from the digestive tract often are causing acne in the first place. And so, you know, PUFAs can be immunosuppressive, which is oftentimes why people say like, oh, I did seed cycling and I saw like my cycle regulator. Oh my gosh, I did, you know, I implemented flax seeds and I feel so much better. Or, oh my gosh, like I did ALA and my skin cleared up. And it's like, yeah, because they're immunosuppressive in the short term, but what does that mean long term? That's, that's a negative thing long term. We don't want to, to take something that's immunosuppressive just because it gives you short term positive effects doesn't mean that's good. Um, so it's just always in context. Do you recommend taking glutathione? What is a good brand? No, um, your body makes glutathione and should be making glutathione. I recommend high vitamin C rich foods like orange juice and bell peppers and papaya and mango. And, um, you know, even if we need to supplement with a whole foods vitamin C, that's great. But, um, personally, I'm not a big fan of supplementing things like glutathione. If the milk of magnesia does not get clear in the high carbonate water, is that still good to drink one fourth cup a day? Yeah, I mean, sometimes there will be some sediment at the bottom. Maybe try a little less uh, milk of magnesia next time and see if it will all dissolve. I finished FN a few weeks ago. I've been almost poof poofa free for that time and my face got very inflamed recently. Could this be detox? I'm overweight and working on my health. Should I take vitamin E? Um, you know, it's possible. A lot of people will go through a period of time where they... um. Um, well, I, I don't want to call it detox because I hate throwing out that word, but there is like a detoxification kind of period. Um, some people are really sensitive to things like dairy or, um, certain, certain food items. So make sure you didn't go too fast too soon. Um, are you doing the specific things recommended like a raw carrot salad every single day? Um, but it definitely can be detoxification. Um, it's one of those things where how long has it been? I think you said a few weeks ago. Um, so yeah, it can take a little bit of time. A lot of women will report like two or three cycles being kind of rough. And then usually around that fourth cycle, things really start to improve as long as they're being consistent with things like raw carrot salad, keeping blood sugar balance, making sure they're getting enough protein, that kind of, kind of thing. Um, vitamin E can, can be a supportive thing. Um, we don't want to overdo it on vitamin E. It is, has a blood thinning effect. Um, it, and we don't need a lot of it to go a long way. So it really depends. But if you're, if you are overweight and, and you do believe that maybe polyunsaturated fats could be coming from the fat tissues, because that is often the case if we eat high PUFA diets over our lifetime and we have a lot of fat in storage, those PUFAs are stored in the fat cells. So sometimes vitamin E can be protective against that and can be anti-inflammatory against that. And, and remember, it is an antioxidant, so it kind of prevents some oxidation from occurring. So yeah, I, I think that is something that could definitely um, apply to you. That is very possible. How can we know if we are at a point metabolically where we should be sipping on OJ or something consistently and how long to carry this on? Some people really, they can't go a long time without eating before starting to feel like irritable. I know with me, like post keto, I was so shaky all the time. Like I started like my, my jaw would start like jittering, you know, like when you have the shivers and you're kind of like, uh, like I would get so like stressed out that I would literally be like chattering. Like it's weird. Um, so that was me for a while. Um, I came from, you know, when I had a low carb pass, I knew my liver was very poor <laughs> at, at, um, hanging on to blood sugar. I was burning through it faster than I could store it. And so I knew kind of like with my past and how I was responding to stressors, I needed to kind of sip on something constantly. But then I've gotten to the point now where like, I don't really need to do that. There might be some days where I'm a little bit more stressed out than others and I will do that. But 
overall I don't need to do it as much anymore. Um, but I think it's really just important to kind of like go by your temps and pulses. Some people like have really chronically low temps and pulses and they can't get their temps up, can't get their pulses up. And so that can help them. Um, or they're just feeling constantly anxious. And the only thing that helps them kind of chill out is just by constantly sipping on something that has some sugar in it. How do you tell if you're low in selenium spelling the thing in Brazilian nuts you mentioned earlier? Personally, I do a hair tissue mineral analysis on, on clients to kind of see where their mineral levels are at, their mineral status. Um, I think doctors can run blood tests that test for like selenium levels as well. I'm not sure. Um, it just depends. Some minerals um, doctors like won't run. So that's kind of how I go about it. But a lot of people that have thyroid issues tend to be on the lower end of the spectrum when it comes to like uh, selenium. You mentioned some women need to zip on a sip on a shake drink all through the day before. What type of person could use that method? Someone, like I said, that has like very are very symptomatic that um, can't calm their anxiety. They can't calm this like I always say there's there's no inner peace. There's no inner calm. It's a constant almost like internal tension. It's like feeling tense or tight and you can't explain it or constantly feeling like really stressed out, or constantly feeling very, very overwhelmed about everything or um, like you're so overwhelmed and you're like, that's something that shouldn't really be that overwhelming to me, but yet I'm very overwhelmed and very stressed out about it. Like I'm almost manic. And those are the type of people that sometimes need it. If, if a meal every three hours is not enough for them. Now, a lot of times people come to me like, do I need this? And I'm like, are you really being consistent about eating, you know, breakfast within an hour of waking and then a snack three hours later and then lunch and then a snack three hours later and then dinner and then a snack. You know, if you are being consistent about that and you still need to sip on something, then that's that, you know, it very might be possible that you're just in that place where your body needs that. But usually they, they only need it for a short period of time, like six weeks, eight weeks sometimes um, it is usually enough. But yeah, it's really about going by symptoms. If temps and pulses are not raising and you're like just constantly feeling very anxious, then that is the type of person that might benefit from from sipping on something pretty frequently. Do you need to do nasal thermometer for checking temp in the morning or is normal thermometer okay? Yeah, I personally just recommend like an under the tongue thermometer. Um, never done like a nasal thermometer. And boyfriend's temp keeps being around 97.2. Why so low? So an article that average should be changed to be lower than 98.6, do you agree? <laughs> I don't think that we should shift the the new, um, shift what our, what an optimal body temperature is for the new normal because now everyone's poisoned by iron and PUFAs and uh, now all their metabolisms are working really crappily. And so now we've moved the, the, um, the average body temperature lower to um, kind of accommodate all these really sick people. So personally, I don't think we should lower our, our standards um, to, to get what the base of the population has because honestly, the standards and the average of our population is really not a great, not a great average. So um, I personally still aim for 98.6. And 97.2 is most likely stress, you know, is he eating enough? Everything I talk about applies to men too, if not more so. Oftentimes men don't realize um, their sexual organs uh, require a ton of energy. Sperm, creating sperm and um, tr truly like the male gonads have a high, high need for sugar, fructose, energy. And so when they're not getting enough or their stress levels are high, it's really going to suppress their metabolism and their testosterone production quite a bit, quite a bit. So yeah, it's possible that, you know, everything I talk about here is going to apply to a man except for maybe like the, the obviously like reproductive type stuff um, and, and cycles. Men have a little bit of a different cycle. Their testosterone spikes in the morning and lowers over the course of the day, gets the lowest at night and then peaks in the morning again. Hey Jess, hope you're well. Do you like licorice fruit to ease digestion? Hey, I hope you're well too, Alyssa. And uh, I, I do like deglycerized licorice root can be very calming and soothing. Um, yeah, it, it can be really calming and soothing. Any type of herb like that, I never recommend taking long term. It's always a good idea to take like, you know, four to eight weeks and then take a break. There are sometimes like these, um, you can probably find some on Amazon, but they're like chewables that are, have mostly deglycerized licorice root and they can be really soothing to like the esophagus, the esophagus, <laughs> the esophagus and the stomach lining and stuff like that. So yeah, it can be really soothing to the digestive tract for sure. 
Um, just started getting three consecutive months of periods after no period for three years. Son is two and a half by your recommendation. Yay. I saw integrative PA found IGF one is six fifty five. She recommended keto and intermittent fasting thoughts. You guys know how I feel about keto and intermittent fasting. Everyone and their mom says that that's the best. And we know that anytime we cut carbs, our body has to manufacture carbs and usually does it out of our tissues. Um, but you know, I highly recommend doing what your gut says and listening to your healthcare provider. I usually take turmeric curcumin supplements every day and now we'll probably switch to golden milk. Oh yeah, it's really delicious and it's kind of a fun thing to eat. I was wondering if this helps inflammation. Yeah, you know, um, you know, turmeric is not, remember curcumin is the active compound found in turmeric. So, um, curcumin supplements are going to be a little bit more pricey than like golden milk or just straight turmeric pills for a reason, because they're not, uh, they're actually extracting the active compound from turmeric. But, um, some people find the same benefit from doing like golden milk as they do curcumin or turmeric. Um is oh um katie said she meant meant basal body temperature or basal body thermometer not nasal and i was like yeah i've I've never heard of nasal yeah usually a basal body thermometer is a little bit better just because you can track the minute changes especially if you're not getting a shift in your temperatures and you're really frustrated you can kind of say like oh maybe i am shifting it's just taking more time to actually read on a regular thermometer is low energy in the AM and high in the PM related to cortisol? What do you recommend? Sorry for asking so many questions. Never say sorry, guys. This is a QA. and a um, Yeah, usually it's an imbalanced circadian rhythm. So are you getting a lot of light at night and maybe not a lot of sunlight during the morning unintentionally? A lot of times we're doing this stuff unintentionally. It's not me saying like, are you doing this? It's more like we're unintentionally getting a lot of light in the evening and not really getting any sunlight in the morning, which is really messing up our circadian rhythm. So that would be like the first thing is just get some sunlight in your eyes and when you wake up throughout the day, like making sure you're getting light exposure and then be conscious of what's going on at night. Like, are you getting lots of light at night? Maybe wear blue blocking glasses, make the lights a little dimmer. Um, light is huge. And then the second thing would be like after doing that consistently, if that's really not working, then kind of paying attention to, are you eating within an hour of waking up? Um, and then sometimes a bedtime snack can kind of help us sleep better. Like I find that, um, I struggled with like poor sleep for years and I was like, God, all I had to do was just eat some damn ice cream before bed and I would have been fine and dandy, you know? So that's just kind of like an observation that I made with me and a lot of my clients. What is acupuncture good for? Do you suggest? Well, you know, traditional Chinese medicine is a whole practice and um, it's kind of based on the meridians of the body. Um, and that's what acupuncture, it kind of stimulates different meridians, opens up blocked energy flows, things like that. I'm not an expert for sure. Um, I do know it works a lot for like things like pain and um, like fertility stuff, but I think it really depends on the person. If uh, you're not seeing any benefit from it, it kind of like stresses me out, like laying of needles in my face. Like I just kind of like start to like really work myself up. Like, like, oh my gosh, like it just is weird to me. Um, I used to really love it and now I kind of just don't like it. I don't know if it's just a personal problem or what, but, um, I find that like if you're working on specific issues, it's much more helpful than if you're like, I just want to like balance my sleep or whatever. Like it just kind of, I don't know. It does work for sure. It just, it, it depends on what you're, you're trying to work on. So if we have a hundred grams of protein a day, then ratio wise, what should we aim for in grams for carbs and fat? Um, you know, it's like usually around the breakdown is going to be around 50% carbohydrate, 25% protein and 25% fat. That's going to look a little bit more than hundred grams of protein for most women. Um, that's going to look around like 45 to 55 grams of fat and sometimes around like 200 to 250 grams of carbohydrate, which sounds like a lot. So don't just go from like your low carb diet to like a higher carb diet. Sometimes we need to shift that over a lot, uh, um, a long period of time. Is red light better in AM, PM? Does it matter? I personally don't think it matters. I find that I do better when I like turn it on in the morning, which is often what I'll do. I clamp it to my headlight and I'll, or my, uh, my headboard and I'll turn it on when I'm like lounging in bed. Like when I first wake up, I'll kind of lounge in bed for like 10 minutes. And so it's just an easy way to get it in. Um, but I think that a lot of people find benefit from using it before bed. I think really whenever we can get it in, we should get it in. Causes of really two cloudy periods, 10 days apart. Hmm. Um, you know, I, 
anything that I would say would be speculation, but, um, I, yeah, I'm, a lot of times, like, cloudy periods are driven by stress, um, like, high stress hormones, cortisol and adrenaline, or, um, uh, estrogen like lots of like estrogen detoxification or just estrogen in general um but sometimes like stress is going to impair that right imbalanced blood sugar is going to impair that sometimes we'll go through something like finals or we're having having a really stressful week at our job or whatever so we're really stressed out and so something like that will happen but yeah i'm not really sure like two cloudy periods 10 days apart that is really really interesting what what supplements are you on like those are things to maybe stop you know if, if um supplements are could be causing an issue you if you're on supplements um, but yeah I would evaluate like supplements stress if anything in your environment has changed if anything like in your you know stress environment has changed um, emotional environment those are all kind of things I would evaluate but yeah I'm really not sure that's that's really interesting having two cloudy periods very close together um, but yeah if you're on supplements I would I would definitely stop everything and see if that that could be maybe doing a factor because a lot of women will implement supplements over time kind of collect things and they're not really focusing on and this is not just to you Ellie this is just like me making a general statement is sometimes we'll like hear something's really good for us and we'll take it and we will just continue to take it without remembering like hey I was taking this for a specific reason and I don't really need to take it anymore so maybe I should just stop it now instead of just continuing to take it or sometimes supplements need to be lowered like we don't need to take it every day anymore and then we like push ourselves in another direction so supplements are sometimes taken for a specific purpose and then we often like forget that and we just kind of start taking every day because it's just routine and habit and so the whenever some something weird happens it's always a good idea to evaluate like what supplements am I taking um and have I just kind of collected stuff over time and do I know if any of these are causing that are you planning to do just an HTMA option instead of the full package to work with you? Yeah, so there's a lot of shifts and changes going on right now. Um, I was actually going to make an announcement in Fully Nourished tomorrow. Like, there's going to be some um, good changes, not like, oh my gosh, bad changes. Just exciting, different, new things to look forward to. And then also um, with working one-on-one -on -one with me. So I'll definitely um, update you guys once that's changed. Do you think a 15 year old could benefit from progesterone oil? Um, usually the recommendation is not to use it on someone that's uh, younger than 18, I believe. Um, but that would be something like, I'm sure, you know, it would be a better option if your doctor said yes to that over like something like birth control. So I think um, it's really like in context, but personally, like I wouldn't mess with that until later on I would look at more like diet and lifestyle type things like where are the stressors coming in uh, is there enough like minerals like just things like that before doing progesterone oil on such somebody that's so young given many estrogen dominant symptoms yeah I mean if, if, if a, a 15 year old has estrogen dominant symptoms it's oftentimes due to her lifestyle um, so if she's like, I always evaluate, um, sports is a big one. A lot of girls are like working out, like literal, like being forced to work out like athletes when in reality their bodies are developing, they are not in a place to be handling that amount of stress. And, you know, um, so like making sure they're getting enough calories to kind of combat that enough sleep to combat that. And oftentimes the schedule, school schedules don't allow for it. So, you know, they're overworked, they're overexercised, they're underslept, they're underfed. And that's like a horrible way to develop, you know, being this kind of like really last place portion of our development, our reproductive development. And so that's just something to kind of keep in mind. Oftentimes, like if a teenager is having estrogen dominant symptoms, it's due to stress. It's due sometimes to like excessive polyunsaturated fat intake. If there's like lots of gluten in the diet, lots of processed foods, lots of, um, uh, like canola oil and soybean oil, then of course those things. Um, but sometimes the, the simplest changes are going to be the ones that are the most helpful. Things like raw carrots every day, magnesium, um, you know, lowering the amount of exercise if that's, if that's a driving factor, um, increasing sleep, like just those things. Like they're, they're, it's, it's something as simple as just evaluating the lifestyle. And I know I oftentimes when I see like teens, it's kind of like, it's hard because it, it is, so, there's so much pressure for our young generation to be like, go, 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 go. But I'm like, we have to really remember they're still children. Like they really are still developing. And um, they're in this like very, like this very um, 
very fragile state and we're we're kind of like we're expecting them to act like have busier schedules than adults and it's like they can't handle it like their bodies literally can't handle it they've literally just started producing sex hormones and stress hormones and their cells are super super sensitive to these hormones and so sometimes like it's just as simple as like is my child doing too much and that was just, sorry, that was like a long spiel. I don't know if that's the case with yours, but um, I would look into all those factors before um, thinking about doing any type of hormone supplementation with somebody so young. Do you prefer recommending progesterone oil or cream? Do you see your clients doing better with one or the other? It really depends. Like some people are like, oh, cream. But I do tend to see that if people try the cream and they don't see any results, they see better results with the oil. So usually people tend to say like, wow, the oil is much more powerful for me and the cream does nothing. But then a lot of people say like cream works for me. So it just kind of depends on the person. Do you see probiotics as being one of those temporary or occasional supplements? Yes, or if like you've gone through a specific period um, where you need the pro probiotic support, let's say you had to go on antibiotics for something, then of course, or let's say for example, something like what's going on now happens and we're kind of forced to eat what we have, eat what we've stocked up on, and maybe it's not the most optimal stuff, uh, probably want to do like some probiotics after that. Or if we want extra immune support, probiotics. But yeah, it's definitely not something that I think we need to like take every single day long term. But definitely if we have gut issues or there's specific, you know, things that are driving maybe some gut imbalance, they can definitely be helpful to get us back on track. Is 54 milligrams of zinc too much for a woman? Um, I do believe supplementing an ind any individual mineral long term is going to be problematic for for some, some, something. Um, oftentimes we don't see like the, the effects of something until it's too late. And then we're like, oh my gosh, I wish I wouldn't have done that. So 54 milligrams of zinc is pretty high. Um, that's a lot of zinc. And, uh, remember zinc works in conjunction with copper. It works in conjunction with iron. Um, and it works in conjunction with other minerals as well, like selenium. So it is important to be kind of cautious with any individual, um, mineral. Not to say that, you know, um, a lot of people are deficient in zinc, but um, some people are not. And this is why I prefer getting zinc from smoked oysters or oysters in general. It's a great source of zinc um, that's very bioavailable and provides a, a nice dose of zinc if we're doing them once or twice a week. The functional medicine practices near me use the HTMA where they wash the hair. Would this still be helpful or can I order the HTMA by myself and show them the results? Um, I don't really think that they're very beneficial if they wash the hair. Like, what's the point if they're washing everything off the hair? Um, it's a weird practice. So I, I wouldn't spend my money on it, honestly. Um, I would, I would prefer to spend my money on the one that doesn't wash the hair, which are usually cheaper anyways. Usually like Trace Elements International or um, Analytical Research Labs are the only two that don't wash the hair in the U.S. at least. Um, so... I don't know why people use the one that wash the hair. I think it's just knowledge. Like they don't know that that's not accurate, but I don't really think it's very accurate. What is your view on past emotional traumas impact on health? Of course, guys, you know, um, our, we have physical, our body actually stores physical trauma in our fascia and we can definitely absolutely store um, emotional traumas physically, and then it's going to affect us on a mental level, keeping us kind of in this fight or flight state. It can mess with our vagal tone or our vagus nerve. Um, it can keep us in this very like sympathetic state or nervous system state where we really want to be in that parasympathetic. So it's very important to understand that, yeah, we can definitely have emotional trauma that's affecting our health as a whole. If we are really stressed out or emotional people, and we don't know why or we don't know why our health is just not getting anywhere and we're spinning our wheels, it can oftentimes be due to emotional stress. Now, sometimes that emotional stress is stored physically, that trauma is stored physically, and doing like body work and fascia work can really be very freeing, like, you know, foam rolling, fascia blaster, massage therapy, the Theragun, like all those things can really work out um, uh, physical stored trauma, but then sometimes it's more emotional and needs to be worked through um, with things like therapy. A good way to prepare oysters for the first time, a little nervous. 
Um, it just kind of depends on your, your, they are kind of weird the first time. Like you just kind of have to be like, they're just going to be a little weird. Personally, I will put them in a strainer and, uh, rinse them off because I think the oil on them just makes them disgusting and slimy so I rinse them off really really well get the oil off dry them off like pat them dry squeeze some lemon on them or lime some type of um citrus juice on them and then I put them on a siete tortilla chip lime flavored please and put a little a uh, spicy mustard on there oh so good so good and do it that way and it will you will be like okay these are good um before i was not doing that and then my assistant and me went to hawaii and she was like this is how i do it and i was like oh my gosh these are actually good whereas before i was just like kind of like forcing them down um <laughs> in such a like weird way and so now like i do the siete uh, chip with lime the oysters that have been kind of like rinsed off and then like a little bit of spicy mustard like german mustard and like oof so good so good i feel like very like fancy when i'm eating them i'm like i should just eat these chips with my pinkies up bitch you know <laughs> um i know this has been discussed forever but i'm wondering what your thoughts on the cv outbreak someone has mentioned elderberry to help strengthen the immune system does that help um you know i can't say for sure because no one knows and it's kind of one of those things where i'm personally just gonna do the things that i know are antiviral and supportive which are gonna be things like oregano um keeping my vitamin c levels up um and obviously just supporting myself by eating frequently keeping my protein intake up making sure my gut health is good you know taking my thrive probiotic um, and then I'm making sure I'm sleeping, prioritizing sleep as well. I'm not stressing out. I'm not like, you know, slabbing my hands all over the public areas and like wiping my eyeballs. Like I'm washing my hands thoroughly and, um, I have, you know, my hand sanitizing wipes. I really like these ones called EO. They're lavender scented. I don't know if you can get them now. I couldn't find them at Sprouts today. I was like, wow, this place has been wiped clean. Um, so Personally, I've just been kind of like using what I have. I have some like um, Dr. Bronner's uh, hand sanitizer. I'm just kind of like being conscious, like making sure I'm not touching my face. And uh, yeah, I mean, you kind of have to just, you know, not stress about things like this. Um, it, it is what it is. Um, hello, Jess. What do you recommend for a detox bath? Um, I don't really like recommend anything for a detox bath. Personally, I really like like an Epsom salt bath um, with baking soda. Some other things that you can add in are going to be, um, sometimes people do add magnesium chloride oil. Remember that Epsom salts are magnesium, so you don't have to add extra. Sometimes I will if I'm like in the mood for some extra magnesium or I'm on my period and I'm a little, feeling a little crampy. Um, baking soda is going to be sodium bicarbonate, which is really great, but sea salt works really good as well. Some type of magnesium, some type of salt, and then some other good additives are diatomaceous earth can be really good. It's very rich in silica. Um, bentonite clay is also wonderful. It like really draws things to itself and kind of pulls things through the pores. It's really very detoxifying. Um, apple cider vinegar is another one that's a, a great thing to add. And then one of my favorites, if you're really in the mood to sweat, is Dr. Shinga's Mustard Bath, which you can get on Amazon. It's a little blue can. And oof, oof, that is like, if you really want to like sweat it out, Dr. Shinga's is the way to go. Um, but yeah, make sure you don't replenish your electrolytes after a bath like that. It can really be very like dehydrating and you can really feel kind of like woozy after. So make sure you're doing something that's going to replenish electrolytes like some coconut water. This is coconut water with mango juice and uh, orange juice. It's delish. How long to do spore-based probiotics to heal gut? A few months? Um, usually like three to six months is uh, the way to go. Um, sometimes a little more. Do you think binaural beats help with health? I think they can be kind of relaxing and soothing. Um, I don't think that they like really help with health. Um, I know a lot of them will say that on YouTube, like, you know, binaural beats for endocrine healing or whatever. I don't really, I don't know. Um, but I do know that getting into the theta state can be really helpful, which are things that are going to really like activate the other side of your brain, more creative things. So, 
um, you know, painting and sculpting and coloring and making bracelets and things like that. Those are all going to be things that really get you into that theta state and like really kind of help you relax and can be very healing because oftentimes we're in that like more logical. Um, I'm getting them confused right now. I believe it's right brain is more like logical and left brain. No, left brain, left brain, right brain. I'm like, I'm, I'm tripping right now. So, um, don't, don't quote me on those, but it's more like one side of your brain is more logical and more analytical, which is oftentimes the ones that one that we're in constantly. And then the other side of the brain, I believe it's the right brain is a little bit more creative and a little bit more, um, you're, you're, you're in that kind of creative state, you know, when you're bored or you're doing nothing and like all these ideas come to you, that's really the, the side of the brain that you're on. It's the more creative, artsy, um, feeling emotion type, uh, part of your brain. And that is a very important place to, to be because oftentimes we're stuck in that other state. How can you improve vagal tone? Um, some ways to improve vagal tone are going to be like, um, vibration noise in the throat. So like, hmm, or like, uh, um, I know it's weird. Or, um, you can actually like, um, do your gag reflex doing anything that's going to be like your gag reflex. So sometimes just like brushing your teeth and at the end of brushing your teeth, you can just kind of stick your toothbrush in the back of your throat and just kind of like implement that gag reflex you don't have to like choke yourself just like a little bit of a gag reflex can be helpful gargling can be another thing anything that's going to cause vibration to the throat um can can be very very helpful um a lot of people say ca coffee enemas can improve vagal tone i'm not how sure how sh um like i'm not sure how accurate that is as well as like some people say like meditation and stuff like that and prayer really anything that gets you in that kind of relaxation state but yeah, anything that's going to like vibrate your throat um, can be very, very helpful at kind of implementing better vagal tone. Which, uh, which probiotic do you recommend for 37-year-old women? Uh, personally, I like Just Thrive probiotics, which you can get on Amazon or Omega Spore probiotic that you have to get through a practitioner. But Just Thrive is my all-time favorite brand, and they are specifically formulated to have really long-term effects in the in the microbiome. Many probiotics out there are absolute scams, absolute shams. They should be ashamed of themselves. Um, so Just Thrive is not that way, and they've been um, uh, formulated in such a way to be. Uh, very long term, like have a very long term effect on the on the digestive tract. Um, I can't really say the dosage on oregano oil capsules. Like you kind of have to look at the bottle and figure something out for yourself. Um, personally, I take a P73 or oregano, which I'll take two to ten drops of per day. But that's what I do. What should one focus on to boost libido? Um, balancing blood sugar. Remember guys that libido is just your craving for reproduction and your body's not going to really expend a lot of energy on sexual reproduction if you barely have enough energy to just do your daily functions. So libido is an extra. It's not guaranteed. Um, so if you're not doing well or you're in a low energy state, a lot of times your libido will be the first thing that suffers or one of the things that suffers. And so keep in mind though that like estrogen dominance can drive an insatiable craving for sex, but um, orgasm would, would be very, very dissatisfying. So keep that in mind. A lot of people that have like hormonal issues are like, I'm fine. My libido is good. And I'm like, well, estrogen can drive that kind of like insatiable desire for sex, but it doesn't lead to a very satisfying climax. And so that's more common with men, but it can be common with women as well. I find a lot of women with PCOS are telling me that and I'm like, a lot of them think it's their testosterone and you guys know me. I'm like, mm, I don't think so. Um, so, um, but libido wise, you know, chocolate can be helpful doing some type of like really, um, nice nutritious snack in the evening. It's like maybe some, um, homemade ice cream, some cacao, um, maybe a little protein powder like collagen or, um, casein protein, like something that's gonna have some fat, some carbs, some protein that can be good. Like remember chocolate is definitely aphrodisiac. Um, trying to think of what else really just like getting enough sleep keeping your blood sugar balanced make sure you're eating enough food in general and sometimes if you go through periods like especially when you're on your journey to balancing your hormones if you go through periods where your libido is kind of lower don't lose hope it sometimes can like go down and up I know this happened to a few girls in fully nourished when they first signed up like they were like my libido is gone and they're like oh it's back 
you know, so it just can, can be an up and down, but you want to make sure that you're doing things that are going to provide your body energy because lack of libido is usually a lack of energy. How to come off allergy meds have been on every day for years and allergies seem worse. Can't handle allergies coming off allergic to basically everything environmental. Um, you know, I can't really give you any like advice on coming off of allergy meds. That's something I would kind of like talk about with your doctor. Um, some things that can help with allergies that like, for, for example, for clients that don't really want to take allergy medication or haven't, and I've kind of like observed what they take over um, the years. I do notice a few clients take something called X clear, which is like a, a nasal spray that has some xylitol and I think grapefruit seed extract in it. They say that that really helps with their allergies. Um, uh, like I said before, there is this homeopathic remedy that I can't remember the name of that is like very regional. Um, and some people do say that quercetin also helps. I'm not sure how true that is, but, um, and then also supporting the gut. So a high quality probiotic, um, raw carrot salad, stuff like that. A lot of times allergies are due to histamines and, um, gut issues. How can you help a body that has asthma asking for a niece or root causes of asthma? Mm, you know, uh, asthma is something like it is like inflammatory lung um, thing and it really depends on the person like some people I've noticed that a lot of people with asthma were born a little early remember the lungs are the last thing to develop in the fetus before the body's actually ready to birth baby and so remember lung development is actually what triggers labor and oftentimes people are induced or they are um uh they go into like a c-section right and their body has not actually naturally gone into labor because the lungs have not finished developing yet the the lungs finishing developing is actually what triggers our labor as women and so those are kind of things like i always kind of observe like did someone go into labor early maybe lungs weren't really done developing like those are things that um could possibly like I'm just thinking could possibly be a factor but I know a lot of people grow out of asthma um but uh using the inhalers are like steroids so usually just focusing on gut health a lot of times does help if it doesn't like fix the issues it does um improve the issues and then also like HEPA filter in your in their environment can help um also humidifiers can very much help like the dryness sometimes affects their lungs and so like humidifiers um can sometimes be helpful for people but it really just like is a little bit of a trial and error and parents kind of have to be dedicated to kind of like figuring out what what helps the asthma and what makes it worse and oftentimes it's going to be very different for each child so I think it's one of those things where um, unless the parents are really devoted to figuring that out it's not something where you can just be like take this you know it's more like okay we've noticed that a humidifier kind of helps the HEPA filter kind of helps a little more like we've done magnesium like I've seen people that do all types of things and so I think it just really depends on the person but oftentimes kids will grow out of it do you need to fast before getting your estrogen tested? What time of the day should you get blood work? And what day of your cycle should you get your blood drawn to check your estrogen level? Estrogen is going to spike the day before you ovulate, and then it's going to have a smaller spike about five to seven days after you ovulate. So if you can time it to, to get your estrogen tested the day before you ovulate, that's going to be like the best for just estrogen. Um, but if you can, if you want to do all your hormones, then usually around five to seven days after you ovulate is pretty good to aim for you don't really need to I don't think you need to really fast for estrogen blood tests I don't see why you would um, and then during the day I mean it just kind of depends if if you have I would say like it, it really doesn't matter um, when it comes to estrogen and, and other sex hormones maybe in the morning but um, they might be worse during the afternoon so I don't you know it's like one of those things where everyone's a little different is there anything we can do to address allergies to animals? Um, you know, it's one of those things where I have actually seen people get improvements to their allergies with animals over time, but then some people don't. And so I haven't been able to like pinpoint or say like, oh, this helps or this doesn't. I do know that like gut issues can play a huge role in just allergies in general, you know, histamines are kind of what drive allergies, but everyone kind of has a different level of allergies to animals. And I, I can't say like, oh yeah, you can totally fix that. Or no, you can never be fixed. Cause I've definitely seen people that say like, yeah, I'm no longer allergic to horses. I used to be super allergic to horses. 
So um, I, w- I would say probably the best strategy would be like supporting the digestive tract and supporting the gut and then like cleaning up the air um, uh, and like using like HEPA filters and stuff. Thoughts on ticks? Um, are you talking about like ticks like Lyme disease ticks? Any good people to follow or research to read regarding Lyme? Can someone still have Lyme but is negative on a blood test? Yeah, Lyme can definitely um, hide. But when we look at Lyme's disease and struggling from symptoms of Lyme, we have to understand that it's layers. You know, a virus is going to be, um, it's not just like the virus, it's all the co-infections as well. Um, there's a lot of like co-infections that usually exist with Lyme and Lyme is one of those things where you can't really like work on the virus itself you're more working on supporting that the organism as a whole so your goal is to really support your body as a whole and um make it less susceptible to the negative effects of the virus and childhood ticks you mean like tick bites and just like having ticks as a child um I or, oh, like ticks. I, I get what you're saying. Like ticks. Um, you know, it's like one of those things where, I mean, we all kind of have our ticks, but um, I'm not, I don't specialize in children. Uh, I just kind of like, like kids. And so I like observe a lot when it comes to like children's health and things like that. And I observe like maybe things in the environment. But I do think like our society, and this is just my personal opinion, like I do believe our society is really like doesn't really set children up for success very well like you know we expect them to sit for eight hours a day we feed them really shitty food um we you know they like sit on screens for hours and hours per day they're no longer like uh allowed the opportunity to learn things how to do things hands-on um go and you know oftentimes children learn um by like getting hurt right like they try something they're really curious they fall they hurt themselves and they learn to never do that again and so that's kind of how children develop and learn and so I don't really think we're allowing that in our in our 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 current situation our current climate it's like kids aren't really you know everyone's a winner and like everyone you know oh no there's no mistakes and there's no you know and it just it really I think it like sets kids up for failure and so I do think there's a lot of things um, going on um, that, that don't set children up well. And then on top of it, like they're eating crappy food, we're being exposed to so many different things. And um, it really depends on the child though. I, I do think there are a lot of factors when it comes to kids that need to be addressed. And it's gonna be really different for every kid. Sometimes kids just need love and they need attention and they need to be paid attention to and they need to be heard and they need to be seen. And if they're not, they're gonna, you know, that's gonna be expressed in some way. So it just kind of depends on the kid. But I do think that when there's an issue, you know, it need, it does need to be focused on and it needs to be observed. And not from the from the perspective of like, what's wrong with my kid or what's wrong with this child, but more like, what could possibly be driving this symptom? Um, what, what it, why is this child expressing this in, in this way, whether it's physical issue or mental or emotional issue? How did you learn about this side of nutrition? Not many people talk about saturated fats being good, temps and pulses, carbs, etc. Um, a lot of research and just personal observation, um, it's not a very common thing, right? Like, you know, I'm, I'm considered a quack, but I don't care. You know, it's like one of those things where if I'm going to learn the truth, I'm going to spread the truth as much as I can. And, you know, I was schooled in a more conventional side of nutrition and I had to go through a lot of crap before I really discovered like, oh my gosh, but I just kept digging and digging and digging. And I finally discovered usually like my biggest thing was when I discovered Ray Pete and Ray Pete's research just really opened my eyes. And there are a lot of other people who have re- done research like Ray Pete. Um, he's not the only one, but he's like his whole life was spent doing research and stuff like this. And so his research is very illuminating and it allowed me to really pull a lot of puzzle pieces together because I had already been studying nutrition and hormones for so long. How to raise white blood cells? Um, you know, like those kinds of questions, I really kind of like, I, I don't know how to answer because I don't know what's going on. Um, sometimes something as simple as like probiotic and immunoglobulins can be really helpful. Sometimes people have other issues going on. And so, you know, I don't know. I, I want to just say like, I don't know because I don't know you. Depression and hormones. What's the biggest imbalance to cause this? If the depression gets worse, the second half of the cycle, 
often it's estrogen issues. Um, and so it's kind of like very important to track your cycle and track your symptoms in accordance with your cycle. So when does the depression and get worse in the cycle? Is it when you ovulate? Is it right before you start your period? Because that will really tell you because that's where your you you know where your hormones at are at in regard to your cycle. Um, your view on Kangen water, water with pH of eight and nine, good or bad? Ugh, scam, biggest scam of a lifetime, man. If you're gonna spend that much money on a water filter system, get like a pristine hydro or something. Like I do not understand, it's such a scam. It doesn't filter anything. It's so crazy to me that people spend their hard earned money on that. Matt Blackburn talks about taking aspirin and vitamin E together, working synergistically against estrogen, but do you see this being a problem thinning blood? Um, I just think it's something to be aware of. Like personally, I take both. I take aspirin and vitamin E. I don't really stress about it, but I do fo- but I know how to look for things in regards to blood thinning, whereas maybe somebody else wouldn't, which is why like I, I just always am more pre- like I, I do like encourage precaution and people being careful because I don't want someone to come to me and be like, oh my god, like, you know you recommended this and it thin it thinned my blood, you know? So I just really, you know, I, I encourage people to be just educated and informed and to err on the side of caution. Personally, I have not seen any problems with it, but I also take vitamin K too, to kind of like work on um, uh, proper clotting mechanisms. Um, so, but I haven't seen any problems with it. The only th- time that there are some people that report like getting things like hemorrhoids or, um, easily bruising and stuff like that. And those, those are things where, you know, you're, you're seeing signs that, that blood is a little too thin. If you don't mind my asking, do you think you would homeschool if you have kids? Just curious. Yeah. Uh, if you guys don't know, fun fact about me is I was homeschooled my whole life. So I was homeschooled, um, since I was, uh, in kindergarten. So, um, I like homeschool is kind of the norm to me. Um, I didn't love it in high school. I thought I was like a freak and I probably was, you know, <laughs> but, um, now I look back and I'm really thankful for the sacrifice that my mom made for both me and my brother. Cause she homeschooled us all the way through. And so, yeah, now like naturally I would, I want to homeschool my kids for sure. Um, so yeah, definitely would homeschool, will homeschool my kids and planning on that. And that's definitely something like my boyfriend is on board with as well, because, um, it's not for everyone. And like, I want to make sure that my boyfriend's on the same page, uh, before we get married and have kids, because, um, if he's not, you know, I got, I gotta, I have some weird, you know, ideas. I'm going to be feeding my kids weird. I'm going to be schooling my kids weird. And so it's important (laughs) that you have someone that's on the same page. Root causes of inflammation, stressors, stress. Um, people just don't realize that being in this constant, like low carb, low energy, low nutrition state is the driving factor of inflammation. And I wish I would have known this eight years ago when I started a paleo and anti-inflammatory and SIBO diet and a Hashimoto's diet when I was trying to treat all my autoimmune diseases. And I just kept getting more and more inflamed. Like I got to the point where I had like these red rashes all over and I would like turn bright red every time I like walked up a, a flight of stairs and I would be like, I'm eating so healthy. Like, why am I so inflamed? And like, I'm not eating any sugar or dairy or, and I was just like, now I look back and I'm just like, because I was so stressed out. Like my body was so stressed and never had the carbohydrates it needed. It never had the nutrients I needed. I was always in this kind of like deficit and I was always focused on taking my supplement stacks and eating, you know, avoiding all these foods that I never really focused on. Wow. I need to be on a low polyunsaturated fat diet. Stop eating so many damn nuts and seeds. I need to make sure I'm getting nutrient dense foods from things like dairy and of high quality meats and saturated fats and stuff like that. And I need to just make sure I'm nourished. Like I never was really being um, cognizant of like, am I eating within an hour of waking? Am I eating every three to four hours and like nourishing my body with nutrient dense foods? And if I would have done that, my inflammation would have gotten so much better. Craziest thing is like, I was, I never was more inflamed than when I was on like a keto, paleo, low carb diet. And now like I eat things like sugar and dairy and I've never been less inflamed in like the past like eight years than I do now, than I am now. And it's just so crazy. Like I've never had 
this little gut issues or like the this good of digestion when I was on like all this eating tons and tons of fiber and cruciferous vegetables like I was constantly just like bloated and uncomfortable and I'm just like Jessica I could have eaten ice cream and saved myself from the misery and the pain for white blood cell question it's my bf his ms med has brought them down doc wants him to stay on and test him for six months but worried for him because of the virus so want to support him if possible oh yeah you know it's like one of those things where um when it comes to like any type of autoimmune disease or something that's going to be regulated with like some type of um immunosuppressive then it's just kind of one of those things where yeah I mean always like eating healthfully and um supporting you know the body with nutrient-dense foods and good sleep and um red light and stuff like that can always be good and the white blood cell count may or may not respond to things like that but those are always good things to practice regardless you know and um, but I'm not sure in regards to like how that would, um, how, how to help, uh, the white blood cell counts change, um, when it comes to something like that. I've been told I need to be low carb for my carbohydrate metabolism disorder. Yes or no. Well, I can't answer that because I don't really know the specifics of your case. Um, I don't know what practitioners you're working with or anything like that. Who the heck told you you have carbohydrate metabolism order disorder? To me, like, that just is, like, such a cop-out. Like, if someone can't metabolize carbs, the literal energy source of the body, why are we not fixing that issue? Why are we just saying, let's just cut the carbohydrate issue? Why, why not focus on fixing the carbohydrate metabolism issue. Like, I just don't understand the mindset there. Um, but that's just me personally. Like, I'm someone that's always like, well, why? Like, why? And I've learned over the years as I've worked with so many practitioners and so many different people, I just was like, uh, every time they would tell me to do something, like, oh, you need to cut carbs. I, I had one practitioner tell me, like, I'm only allowed to eat protein and berries. I remember somebody else told me I was, you know, I had to cut all the foods I was allergic to, which was 72 foods, mind you. Um, I, I remember so many times being told just the most confusing and conflicting information. And one day I just started asking the practitioner one word, and I would say, Why? why is this happening to me? Why? And they'd be like, uh, 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 and they would like spew that stupid word genetics. And I was like, you know, we're, we're not going there because we all know that genetics play a very small role. So I need a better answer before I start to like, I would like literally like I would come home. I still remember like I'd come home from a practitioner appointment or come home from a doctor's appointment or get off the phone and be like, okay, I need a, this whole new regimen. And I would like go to the grocery store and I would spend thousands of dollars on supplements and it would just be like a month later and I would stick to it like super, like super glue and nothing would change or I would get worse. And I was just like, oh God, I fell for it again. And I got to the point where I didn't fall for it anymore. I, I decided I was just going to get to the root cause of the issue and not, not treat my labs and start actually working on my body itself. Hi Jess, live on a Monday. Yay, yay. Ask your questions quick because I've been on for a while and I don't want Instagram to uh, cut me off, but there's plenty for you to listen to um, when I'm done with this. Can you please explain why people can get knocked out asleep by drinking a drink high in sugar? Is it the wrong kind of sugar or the combo? To get knocked out of sleep, do you mean just because um, it's a sedative? Yeah, sugar is a sedative. Um, it makes us sleepy and relaxed, which is interesting for the people that say that sugar is a stimulant, which is what a lot... Everyone that says sugar is inflammatory says sugar is a stimulant. And I'm like, why do you think sugar is a stimulant? Everyone feels relaxed and calm and like no anxiety after drinking something with sugar in it. And if you're talking about, I mean, it's always in context. Like, are we talking about high fructose corn syrup, sugar, like sugary drink? Because remember, high fructose corn syrup is like 40% or 50% starch. Starch is going to make us really sleepy and cause need, need a, a larger insulin response than sugar, which is sucrose, which is half glucose and half fructose. So it's always in context. People love to use the like this dirty word sugar. And I'm like, well, what type of sugar? Like, are you drinking high fructose corn syrup? That's like a processed half fructose, half starch, genetically modified, weird science experiment. It's a little different than like 
white sugar, which was actually traditionally made um, as medicine in traditional Chinese medicine. So it's just like, you know, let's stop using sugar blanketly, just like we should stop using gluten blanketly, just like we should stop using everything dairy blanketly, and we need to remember what are we referring to when it comes to sugar. Um, my mercury level is high. Is that dangerous? Um, I don't want to say like yes or no, but you know, there's no normal levels of mercury in the body. Um, but you know, what did your practitioner who tested you for mercury, um, do about it? Cause that's the person you want to talk to. I don't know, you know, your, your story or your case. And so I don't really want to answer cause I don't have any context. So adding white sugar or coconut sugar to stuff is fine. Yeah, absolutely. Personally, in my opinion, it's, it's amazing for our bodies. Um, is inflammation a cause of cancer? Um, I do believe like polyunsaturated fats and iron poisoning drive cancer, um, but they do drive uh, inflammation. So I wouldn't say inflammation is the cause of cancer, but I do think it's a factor in cancer for sure. Um, no one really knows what the cause of cancer is. Yes, OMG, she couldn't even tell me. All she said was I had high L lactate from my oat. Okay, that can be fixed. All right, guys, Instagram is cutting me off. Thank you so much for spending two hours with me. I'll see you soon.